Well, hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends, where our goal is to show and grow a passion for studying God's Word. I'm here with my friend, Jake Curtis, and Jake and I are going to continue in a topical series of Bible study tools and how to use them. And last week, we talked about the tool of training your mind to ask the who, what, when, where, why questions. And I mentioned that one of my favorite things to do in a Bible study is to ask the question, what does that mean? And we're going to talk more about that question and answering the what that means question and the tools that we can use to answer that particular question. And we'll do that when we come right back. Hi, and welcome back to Bible Study with Friends. So I said, I'm here with Jake, and I are going to continue in this series. And we're going to continue in probably the second easiest. Last week, we talked about the easiest tool, Jake, and that is your mind, the who, what, when, where, why question. And then once you ask the question, you go and find the answer using other tools. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the question... What? What does that word mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? You then have to have a tool to go get it. And this is probably the second most available tool. And I want to talk about two tools today. The first is the, the easiest access tool. And the second is a little bit more difficult, but it's a great tool. And I want to talk about it. So we'll get started today right now yeah, as we go okay uh, are you are you enjoying the tools yeah i think yeah it is helpful just to have that reminder to ask those questions those five w's and yeah. to get you started if you're if you're wondering how That's to study those start because great. once you ask the question you get now you can go then you're curious where do i go for the answer yeah i was just in california this last week and and i met with a guy and we were talking about these very things. He wants to get serious about studying the Bible, and he wanted to know some basic tools that he could use to get serious. He has read the Bible for years, but now he wants to get really serious about studying the Bible. And we talked about these very things. And in fact, I referred him. I said, watch, watch that video series on you Bible study with friends, and uh, you'll get some good answers. Good. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about asking a question. And I'm going to give you a, a sample. Let's go to an example of this. You're studying along, and this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And let's, first of all, let's say you're reading 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, what, what's a what question you'd ask yourself in verse one? What is an advocate or what is sin or? Yeah, you could ask any of those things. Yeah. Um, and most of us really know in our gut what sin is. But you could say yeah. an, an advocate. We, we have an advocate. What's an advocate? Now, some translations, some uh, study Bibles will help you. You see this little number right here? This little number one? Yeah. But if you go over to verse 1, the Greek word is parakletos. And parakletos is, uh, means one who's called alongside to help. And another word for that is an intercessor. So you could say, if anybody sins, we have somebody designated to come alongside and help as, a, as an intercessor. Yeah. So right there, that would help. Now, you could go to our tool and look up that word advocate in just a second. But that would help you start up your Bible study. And I put in my notes over here, like an attorney, he's available as an advocate. And he's there to help us. He's there to intercede for us with the judge. And then it says in verse 2, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Now, what's an obvious question? 
What does propitiation now, mean? <laughs> you and I would be reading that, and we would come to that word propitiation. Now, a lot of us would just keep reading. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for those of the whole world. But a, a Bible study, you're not just going to read that and skip over that word. You're going to ask yourself the what question, and that is, what does that mean? Propitiation. And that's where I want to talk about various tools. So the first tool that we go to that's available online, it's available old school in print, is the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. And Merriam-Webster's is based on the Webster's Dictionary. And one of the reasons that I really strongly recommend the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary as compared to the Funk and Wagnall or Harper's, or and there's a million dictionaries out there. But I prefer and recommend the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary because Webster was a Christian. Okay. And a lot of his definitions that he uses are biblical definitions. That he uses in his dictionary, you mean? In his dictionary, yeah. And it's, it, it's an interesting story. Now, Webster, in the 1800s, he was discouraged that all the dictionaries out there and all the meanings for words were from English versions. And he said, we really need an American dictionary. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote his, he put his dictionary together in the, I think the first edition was about 1828. And when he was putting together that dictionary, and it took him a long time to do it, he he Americanized a lot of the definitions. That's why, for example, in Merriam-Webster's, the word theater is spelled differently than theater in England. Oh. It's, it's spelled E-R instead of R-E. And oh, okay. words like corp uh, where, or the core of an issue is spelled with an E in England and here. I mean, there's a lot of these examples where he Americanized it for the American audience and said, this needs to be an American dictionary. Now, it's interesting. Webster had a religious background. He was raised in a congregational church. His dad was a deacon. He, he went to church all the time. But not until he got married and his wife and kids became Christians evangelical Christians, did they drag, they dragged him, drugged him, they, they brought him to a revival meeting mm -hmm. that was an evangelical presentation of the gospel as an adult. So he becomes a Christian, and he becomes very serious about his Christian faith. In fact, he read the Bible to his kids every day after that, had family devotions. He was very serious about his Christian faith that was after he was an adult, he became solid in the faith to the point where after he was done with the American Webster's Dictionary, he decided that, in fact, he said, he was quoted as saying, the most important thing I can do is come up with an American Bible. And he spent a number of years really translating the King James, which is English, Old English, into an American vernacular Bible. And unfortunately, he ran into all kinds of problems because people were saying, oh, no, the King James is the only way to go. And it wasn't a very much of a success. But he, and it's very rare now to find a good Webster's standard Bible. But he really got this idea of writing a Bible that would be translated for the average person to read. Mm. So while he's doing this Bible, he came to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, the word propitiation. He had to come up with a definition that was a solid definition of what that word meant and many other words. That's why I recommend Webster's dictionary. Now, after he died, Noah Webster, his estate, sold the rights to the dictionary to the company Miriam. And it became the Miriam Webster's Dictionary. 
and they liberalized some of the definitions a little bit, but it's still solid biblical definitions in many of the world. Okay, I want to give you an example of that. Merriam-Webster's is available online as a free application. You can yeah. get the Merriam-Webster's Thesaurus or the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. And let me show you what it looks like to go to the page online. Now, here's, here's an example of Merriam-Webster's. This is their website. And I've got it under my resources so I can constantly refer to it. But here is the word propitiation. And it, the definition is the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. The act of propitiation or the act of propitiating is appeasement. So if you went back and said, okay, Jesus is our propitiation, you could use this dictionary to say, oh, okay, so Jesus is meant to appease God, and in the text of verse 1 and verse 2, because of our sin. So it's not there to earn us salvation. It's there as a part of our salvation that Jesus is our propitiation for sin. Okay? Now, it, and it's very interesting. Then it gives a quote, and it's, it, there's a quote from Charles Dickens that says, she showed every possible desire to conciliate him, and there was an air of humble propitiation in all she did. So she was trying to gain favor by being a propitiation. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that dictionary, the, the Merriam-Webster's dictionary is a good starting place. And you can use the uh, definition to go back and start to get a, an idea of the meaning and start to think about that in the meaning of the verse. And you can do that with grace, mercy, propitiation, salvation for that matter. And it just gives some good definitions in Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Oh, by the way, if you're going to use a, an old school Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, get the biggest honkinest book you can find. Don't get the little paperback collegiate edition because that's going to leave out a lot of words. Get the biggest hardbound Merriam-Webster's dictionary you can find. And if you can find an old Webster's dictionary, that's, that's even better, but you can get the most exhaustive you can find. Now, when you go on online, that's their entire Merriam-Webster's dictionary, and that's a really great source for you. Mm -hmm. But now let's say you want to go a little bit deeper into that definition of that word. There's another dictionary, and that is called a Bible dictionary. And this is a source book that is a tool that's really meant to be very scriptural and help you in a further study. Now, I'll show you an example of that. Here is a print book that's the Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary. It has some pictures in it, which is always fun. But I'm going to show you an example of right here. Propitiation. So you go to it. Now, what makes this different is, if you notice, it gives you a lot of cross-references. This is one of the semi-technical biblical words which designate the atonement. The English word propitiation is a Latin derivative and signifies blah, 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 blah. Now, it starts to give you, gives you the Greek word there, and it starts to show you verses where that Greek word is used, including our 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, is the same Greek word and, and the translations. Now, as you go through, it gives you all kinds of information, and you can read through. You see how this could help you in a Bible study by going to this word, and it keeps going. It's got a lot of information here, this whole idea of what propitiation means. Does that make sense? Yeah, you, yeah that's pretty cool, yeah. all the extra info. You can see how a Bible dictionary could be a great source now, an online Bible dictionary that I use a lot is called Eastman's. And this is 
in my software that is part of my Logos software, which is the best software. It's not cheap, but it's great. Now, and here's an example where you would look up the word propitiation, and you're going to get cross-references. There's our verse, 1 John 2, 2 and 4, 10. And it, it starts to give you a real biblical definition using some other cross-references. And you can see here where it goes into a bunch of other good, in fact, Old Testament ideas of propitiation. Okay? So we've looked at the first tool is a Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Then you can go to a Bible dictionary, and you can find a Bible dictionary at a used store, and I recommend a good publisher. There's liberal publishers of Bible dictionaries that you get strange definitions. But a Bible dictionary like Zondervan or Word, those publishers will give you a good, solid Bible. And here online, you can go to Eastman's and get a solid dictionary definition of that word. That makes sense? Yeah. Just a quick question. How do you know who's a good publisher or a reputable pub publisher? You go with the major Christian publishers, which are Zondervan, Word, Baker. And those are, I'm just telling you to look for those. But mm -hmm. I pick, if you pick Zondervan or Word or Baker, those are good, solid publishers who don't get off onto weird doctrine. So those are ones that I recommend, okay? Mm -hmm. And those are just good to look for at a used bookstore. Go to uh, the religious books, look for Bible dictionary, and look if you can find a Zondervan or a Word or a Baker, B-A-K-E-R. Those are good, solid. Uh, who, who publishes the Eastman Dictionary, Bible Dictionary? I don't know offhand. I don't know okay. offhand because I use it as part of a this package of software. Mm -hmm. So it's already been doctrinally right. All right. Yeah. So you can just find those tools. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, and if you have a question, if you find one, have a question, you can go to uh, someplace like Wikipedia or something and look up the publisher and you'll start to read the background of the publisher and get a good idea whether it's a solid biblical publisher. But those three, you can't go wrong with Zondervan, Word, and Baker. Okay. So that's this idea of answering what does that mean, and then going and finding the answer to it using either a, a secular dictionary like Merriam-Webster's or a Bible dictionary. Now, the Bible dictionary will help you in other things in that you can look up people. It'll show you, you can look up Joseph of Arimathea, and it'll give you cross-references, and it'll help you with that. You can look up, a, a lot of them, you can look up the book of First Thessalonians, and it'll give you background of when it was written and that sort of thing. So it's a great information source for starting to do deeper Bible study, is the Bible dictionary. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other comments? Do you see how that could really, you could read that word and stop reading. And you could do a Bible study looking at two or three, two or three places, and then thinking about it and finding those cross-references and going to those cross-references. By the way, another great dictionary is Vines, mm -hmm. uh, Dictionary of New Testament and Old Testament. The problem with Vines is it's not, it's not quite as complete, but it really goes into the Greek and it gives you a lot of cross-references again. It's just another tool as you get going. So yeah. a dictionary and a Bible dictionary is how to answer the what question. What does that mean? You go and do that, and you can spend quite a bit of time just making some notes in your Bible saying, oh, that's what propitiation means. But that's a great tool, a highly yeah. recommended tool as part of our Bible study tools on how to use them. I've just gone through how to use a dictionary and a Bible dictionary to get you some great, deep results. Thank you guys for watching. Hope this was useful to you. If you're serious about studying the Bible, these are tools that will help you do that. And if it was a blessing, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and comment. I'd love to hear your comments, and I'll respond to them. And I appreciate you being with us. Next week, we're going to do another tool. 
and we'll talk about the usefulness of more tools to answer more of the questions. In the meantime, God bless you. We'll see you then. Thank you.